Street South. How has the COVID epidemic affected veterans and their ability to function on a, on a normal basis? What is, the, what is the barometer or the temperature, what is the range that they are able to function as human beings? Well, it's been very challenging for our veteran population here in the Bay Area. As you know, in the height of the, the uh, pandemic, the global, this global pandemic, we uh, uh, reserve early store hours for most of our senior and our vulnerable populations. Most of our veterans are meet that criteria. Most of them are over 65 um, and uh, they're having challenges, you know, getting in to get what they need and also getting back home. Um, another thing that's affected them, probably most of the population too, the veterans are being able to um, visit with their families and their loved ones because, you know, they don't want to infect them or have them um, have any un un unnecessary health conditions because of COVID. And um, what I've seen more damningly recently was that the fact that the VA was requiring veterans to be 75 years old to get a vaccination when the state law is 65. So I, I hear that's being corrected, but those are some of the challenges that they're having um, as, as, as it pertains to COVID. Another thing, um, too, um, we have a, a large homeless population and a lot of them are veterans too. And I, I don't know how that happens when they go and they, and they fight for us, us to have some standard life, some freedoms. And we realize that freedom isn't free because these individuals who went and, and paid the price for us to be able to be free are now sleeping in doorways and alleys and, and, and in parks. You know, so we have got to do more deliberately to, to help our veterans. It's, it's important. Um, the um, death rate. Are you, do you have any knowledge of the death rate of veterans? Has it increased, decreased? Um, I, I could say, I don't know if they're tracking it for veterans. We do have a lot of deaths. I think they, we're reaching about 30,000 here in the state of Florida. But I don't know how many, is it broken down how many veterans versus, you know, male, female, and, and then also broken down by race and ethnicity. Um, so I'm not sure of that. I do know that from my time in the legislature, what was most important to me and what I enjoyed most is that no matter what laws we passed and what we did, we always held the veterans and the seniors harmless. We have a huge uh, military base here, uh, and, and within that deal, we have a huge um, retirement veteran population here in the state. So we have created resources to, uh, to help them um, to get to some of those things also. I know that we have a, um, we, we have a, uh, there was one page that just put out with all the, the resources. It was a pamphlet just for veterans. They could go to and find housing, schooling, uh, any um, careers that they might want to get in, any financial aid, you know, all that stuff that's important. Well, basically, it's, it's part of the criminal justice system. It's part of the whole um, uh, industry as a whole. And it's fed by the babies, our future. And the way it goes, basically, in the state of Florida, we incarcerate 94,000 adults. If you want to put that in comparison, Texas, a state twice our size, only incarcerates 40,000 adults. However, last year we arrested 54,772 5 to 17 year olds in the state of Florida. 55,772. That's, if you, if you put it in what Texas is doing, we arrested more juveniles, and Texas is locking up adults. And in that number, that five to seventeen year old demographics, um, it's sixty to seventy percent black boys and girls. So the black and brown population represents the bulk of the ones that are being arrested. Now understand what I'm saying? Juvenile arrest. This is an arrest record. We just talked about the military. If you have an arrest, there will be no military. If you have an arrest, there will be no student aid. And if you have an arrest, there will probably be no jobs. I'm a champion of summer and after school jobs. I bring home resources 
from the state all the time. But if you got a record, you need not apply. So we're talking five to 17 with arrest record already. We're talking mug shots, handcuffs, and fingerprints. Five years old to 17 years old, juveniles. Yeah, juveniles, that's the, the parameter. Um, but to put it in perspective, you talk about 54,772 juvenile arrests, we can adjudicate any one of those babies at the age of 14. What adjudication is is putting them in with adults or try them as adults. Now, if the 94,000 uh, adults I told you about earlier, if one of those get sick or terminally ill because of COVID or whatever else, we have this thing called compassionate release when we send them home. And I call it BS because we don't want to pay the medical bills and we damn sure don't want to bury them. So we send them home to you with two weeks of life left or expectancy and you throw a big barbecue because Billy's coming home and two weeks later, plump, Billy's dead. Once Billy transpires, we reach into that pool of 55,400, I'm sorry, 55,772 juveniles, pluck one out at 14, we can put them in that bed and keep the party going. This is a major industry. That's what this is. And um, the juveniles and the young kids are the ones that are playing the biggest part of it. And that's one year of juvenile arrest. But if you look at uh, when we had this big discussion last year about Amendment 4 and the returning citizens and their right to vote and all that, do you know that with three misdemeanor arrests, it's equal to felony under the 13th Amendment, the state has a right to, it takes away all your rights, so it pretty much turns a man to slave. So these young people, once they get three arrests, can't even vote before they're old enough to vote. So this is Amendment 4 2.0. We've got to be more deliberate at looking out for our young people and our future. Because that's what they're going after. Us as adults, with all of our trappings of success, the homes, the cars, and all that, we're taking the eye off of what's really going on. Uh, you think about it, 55,772 people that can't vote was made that way last year. Because if, and they get two more arrests, they're felons, and felons can't vote down the state of Florida. So we have got to be more deliberate about providing resources to them. It's even more damning here in the city where I'm at. I mean, I once asked the police chief, I said, uh, of our sworn strength with our police officers, how much of their time is spent as it pertains to dealing with juveniles? And he told me, and I quote, he says, I estimate 60 to 70 percent of their time is spent dealing with juveniles. Now, 60 to 70 percent of 545 officers, when you got one officer at the rate of 100,000, that's Kevlar, Taser, Glock, benefit package, uh, car, 100 grand, and put one on the street. So if you multiply 100 grand by 545, that's $54 million. Mm -hmm. And if you multiply that by 60 to 70 percent, that's 30 to $35 million of resources spent dealing with the juvenile population in the city. See, so it's, it's big money. It's big money. Those children mostly come to us by virtue of into the system via the school. And when you talk about school to prison pipeline, this is the way it works. When your kid goes to school for the first day, they come home with a stack of papers. Everybody gets these. And in that stack of papers is something called uh, a code of conduct that you have to sign. It's mandatory that the parents or guardian signs it so the kid bring it back to school. Now this is a code of conduct for the entire school system. But really me this, if a young kid gets into uh, a fight in a, uh, in, a, in a poor neighborhood or a poor area, that young kid, black kid, is, in, is then driven straight to juvie jail or the juvenile detention center. But if, a, if, a, if, a, if a, a young white kid, say Billy, gets in a fight in, in an affluent community, in, in, a, in a nice neighborhood, then he gets a detention. Well, what happens is, like, like I say, you, you get a code of conduct that comes home with the kids, and you have to sign this in the back. And it talks about discipline throughout the entire school system. But that discipline is not administered equally among the races. Because of this lethal black skin that I have, I get treated differently. For instance, if a, if a black kid gets in a fight in, in a poor neighborhood where a high school is or a school, that kid is subsequently more likely to take a ride to the juvie jail or juvenile detention and get a permanent record and an arrest record. But if you're in an affluent neighborhood where, say, a white kid gets in a fight, that kid gets a detention. But a fight is a fight is a fight. But they look the white kid at one neighborhood, he's going to Harvard. And you can't get into Harvard with an arrest record. Whereas this juvenile who just got this record, this African American, now he's done because there'll be no military with arrest. There'll be no uh, student aid and there'll be no jobs because you have to have a clean background to get employment. So what we're doing, we're creating on purpose a second population or, or a, a second underclass population. 
And what that does, it feeds into our adult um, correction um, system. Our, um, our, 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 well, our, our adult department of corrections is because the juveniles are going straight into that. Now, if you think about how you fund the school to prison pipeline, those kids that are arrested in school for fighting or, mis uh, or classroom disruption or whatever it may be, the statute says, and I quote, once a juvenile is transferred um, into a juvenile um, um, detention center or adjudicated as adult, he's, he's, he's out of the school system. So, once, and so it says once a juvenile is committed to a juvenile commitment program, then the general fund is to transfer the money from the last school district in which that child attended into the Department of Juvenile Justice. So now the kid's moving out into the juvenile the justice system and the money's going right with it. Needs to be from the schools, not from, not from the legislature, but from these implicit bias policies that these schools have and they selectively enforce depending on the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. That's what's really happening. That's what's driving the school to prison pipeline. That's the way they pay for it. But it's even worse because once they get there, the Department of Juvenile Justice has currently in their budget uh, $88.6 million for juvenile jail beds. That's 5 to 17 years old, predominantly blacks and brown kids. And that money is 100% privatized. So you you got kids going to a private juvenile facility. And you have these people or politicians tell you that we have to be careful of uh, um, directing funds away from schools for charter schools and private schools and, 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 um, and um, um, whatever other education options that a parent has because it takes money away from the schools. But if you've got policies within a school district that's funneling black boys and girls into the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system then to the criminal justice system and they're paying, then that's money coming out of the schools too. No one talks talk about that. But my philosophy is if, if a kid, if you can go visit your kid in a private juvenile facility so buying three in state class, then damn it, you can sit in the private school. Because all this stuff, 100% of it is all tax money. You know, it's all rhetoric. When people talk about uh, funds going from one place to the other, the bottom line is they're locking up our future. And they make money off of it. This is an industry, hear me. It's a criminal justice industry. And then, and then, and, and because people don't last always, when something happened to that 94,000 adults that we have incarcerated, we backfill it with these juveniles that we keep locking up. So it's just a factory. It's an industry that keeps it going. And unfortunately, it's being fed a lot by these policies that we have in place that afflict you know, black and brown people when it comes to uh, um, um, the school systems, and that's where they're really coming from. Um, it, even if you look at the suspension, we talk about suspensions. I think here in Pinellas last year, there were 8,000 suspensions, in-school suspensions. Over 4,000 out-of-school suspensions. That population now, uh, if you look at the analogy of a suspension, you talk about you depriving the kid of his education. You deprive him of camaraderie with his, with his uh, fellow classmates, because that's when he goes to school to hang out with his fellow classmates. Right. Also, you got him, um, now he's crosshair with his parents, because they're not happy about him being suspended. <laughs> so that's three strikes you got against him. So now the kid's at home, parent can't watch him because the parent has to go to work, right. has to pay bills. So now he's left to his own demise and, 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 and own things that get him into trouble. You know, Tupac said it best, even though the thugs sold drugs, they always show the young brother love. Well, these kids go out looking for love in all the wrong places, and that's how they get caught up in all kind of mischief. And then you know the rest of the story. They end up in the system, and, and, and it goes on and on and on. It never ends. So we can't just utilize the things that we're going to suspend them because that, that doesn't make any sense either. We've got to be more deliberate in trying to educate these kids. We have law enforcement in our schools, and they're there to protect the kids and keep them safe. If you remember Sandy Hook in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, that's where they had you know, little white kids coming to school with their parents done shooting and killing white kids. Well, we, to make sure all of our kids are safe, we put police in every school. Okay, but the problem is that it's not about guns and knives, it's about having the police try to enforce school policies, like for fighting and classroom disruption. None of those things are against the law. Those are school policies. The law, uh, the, the police is there for safety. Okay, and they're law enforcement officers. They're supposed to be enforcing the law, not enforcing school policies. And unfortunately, it's only one person that has the arrest record, I mean, arrest authority and authority to a um, Baker Act, and that's the police. And that's given to them, well, that's directed mostly by the school board having them do this. They don't want to arrest kids, but 
the school board wants them to. Or the, 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 or the, well, I would say the school board because they're the ones that write these policies. They want them to. I mean, last year we had 272 kids, I think, that met the criteria of that were um, committed to juvenile programs, commitment programs. That's a sexy word for locking them up. And the, it was about 42 that was adjudicated adult. Well, those kids don't come back to the system. So when those kids go out, the money goes with them. Because as I said before, when a, a juvenile is committed to a juvenile commitment program, the general funds are transferred the money from the last school district from which he attended into the Department of Juvenile Justice. So that's the funding of the school to prison pipeline. And it's, 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 almost, um, it's almost deliberate in, in, in those implicit bias policies, the way they enforce them. And it affects black and brown kids 100%. Okay, we did, uh, it was a constitutional amendment that was passed by over 60% of the voters. 5.4 million people voted to have, the, to have the right to be able to vote, but when it was implemented by the legislature, it required the, payment of, the repayment of all funds and fees, which kind of blocked those individuals' opportunity to be able to participate in that last election process. Because once uh, fines and fees are paid, then they can register to vote. The platform is, is pretty much simple. It's, it's, it's just restoring our neighborhoods. It's uh, um, increasing public safety. It's affordable. Uh, it's affordable housing through affordable home ownership. Because I want people to be able to own homes. It's um, it, it's our environment with the effects of climate change. We all live in a coastal area. You can't go too far even like crossing the bridge. And last but not least, it's an economic opportunity for all. We have a 96 or 86. Uh, um, acre Tropicana field site with a rage play it has a billion dollars of development potential and there was a promise made to the people which that land was taken from through eminent domain and the promise of progress that should be fulfilled and that's what I mean by economic opportunities for all. This is a nonpartisan position in the city of St. Pete which incorporates 60 square miles wide and about 270,000 people in population. Well, I mean, today is a, is a good day. As uh, you just saw, the Senate just passed the, the $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus relief package. Uh, our own party lines, 50 to 49, the House has already voted on it. So it's going to get some much needed uh, resources here to the people uh, who are suffering. Also, there's money in there for local government to uh, be able to plug up holes because uh, this is a very challenging time. A lot of businesses have been closed. A lot of uh, revenue is generated from commercial leases and rents and whatnot, and you don't get that if they're not paying rent. So we have got to get the, the, the city and the country back on track and get it back going. The president is also in this, this uh, $1.9 trillion stimulus package is going to be able to increase the uh, production of the vaccine. So hopefully by uh, summer, everybody who want to be vaccinated will, will be vaccinated. We can gain herd immunity and get back to what I call a new normal. I won't say normal because normal will kill <laughs> over half a million people, so I can't go back there. But in doing so, you'll get people out more, you get to visit your family more, you get to go and, and, and spend commerce and spend money and get that back into the community. Also, that $1.9 trillion is going to go a long ways in stimulating the economy because that's where the money is going, up to $1,400 for uh, individuals uh, and, uh, and families and they got more chat touch um, care credits for the children. There's a lot of stuff in there and it's going to be very helpful that's needed and unfortunately because of the gridlock in D.C. it's been put off for a long time. Well I, I am hopeful and I can tell you what you, what you, all the things you touched on is basically the revolution being televised. If you remember way back when they said, well, the revolution will not be televised. Well, everybody got cameras. I think I said to you the other day, if you're sitting out front, I got a ring doorbell camera, my neighbor got one, you be in video. If you're outside, 10 times out of 10, you be in video. So now what's happening is all the things that you talked about that were quote unquote um, um, unheard of or unseen are now being seen. They're being Facebook Live, they're being screened. Uh, when they've been on social media, it's hard to suppress all that stuff. So you can see more of it, but what it does is makes us uh, be more human. If you look at the events of January 6th, I thought I was in a third world country. The way those people attacked the Capitol, 
the world is, 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 is responding to a lot of that. Most of them as a retaining the race, so most of these corporations are acknowledging that they don't have a lot of uh, diversity in their upper offices and they're trying to address that. I think it's a good thing. You cut the news on now, you see more people that look like me uh, hosting news shows and doing stuff. And it wasn't always that way, you know. So it's just unfortunate and, and, and George Floyd had to die. I need to watch him die for nine minutes on, on, on live on Facebook Live to for this to be able to come to fruition. But I do I can tell you that the new administration in DC is all about healing. It's all about helping, you know, the vote I just told you about on, on, on the bill in the Senate was down party lines, but as the President stated, he's not giving up because it was a bunch of Republicans that wanted to vote to support that, to help their constituent. But these people that are suffering, they're not just Democrats or Republicans or independent or nonpartisans or no libertarians, they're people in America, and they're all suffering, so they need help. They need help. He talked about it was food lines. I, as a, as a representative, hosted some farm share food lines. We saw Mercedes Benz, Lexus, and Range Rovers in those lines. We saw people with trunks open get boxes of food that never thought they'd be in this, this predicament. And it wasn't just black people, it was white people, brown people, it was everybody. So um, I, I think we're all different, but we're all the same. And I think more now that uh, the revolution is being televised, that people are reacting differently, you know what I mean? It's um, there's been a big push not to have uh, a lot of this stuff come to light, but it's too late. Like I said, if you're outside, if you're anywhere, and the neighbor has blow up that camera, it's being it's being it's being filmed. You know, all police officers come to the house and go, you have some footage from so and so in this time, and sure enough, you'll be there live in the full color. So the technology has also made that more. Um, they pushed it more to the front. Then we got our young people who are mobilized. Not just, I mean, all of our young people, black, white, young, old, straight, gay, out there, you know, um, out there protesting and doing things to try to keep the issue to the front page. But our job as elected officials and, and being in governance is to make sure that we, with our seat at the table, make sure those policies are put in place to protect them and, and to make sure we all can live uh, and play well in this thing we call uh, the sandbox, which is our country.